Are you listening? Good. Around the world, over 8 million young people go missing every year, including adults, that number is likely to be many times that. Approximately this means that excluding adults, 666,000 young people go missing every month. That's 166,000 every week, 23,000 every day, 960 every hour, and 16 every minute. While most of these disappearances reach a satisfactory conclusion, some seem to occur under very unusual circumstances. Sometimes, individuals are found weeks later in an area already searched, on the coroner isn't sure as to the cause, sometimes the clothes are missing, particularly noteworthy are the shoes. And while these disappearances are generally rare, they do exist and seem to take place in rural areas. In this video, I wanted to explore just some of these kinds of disappearances that have been reported all over the world, so let's start with one that took place last month. I'm going to be completely honest, this disappearance was hard to write about, and it's just completely heartbreaking. That's not to say that similar incidents aren't, but this one just seemed to hit home pretty hard for one reason or another, but I do think it's absolutely critical to talk about this. This is Nora Quirin. She went missing while on a family holiday in Malaysia. The Quarin family were staying at the jungle resort known as Dusun. This is near Seremban, approximately one hour south of the capital, Kuala Lumpur. Nora was 15 at the time of her disappearance and suffered from a condition known as holoprosencephaly. This is a disorder caused by the failure of the prosencephalon to sufficiently divide into the double lobes of the cerebral hemispheres. The result is a single lobed brain structure. To explain that at a very simple level, it means that the brain did not form as it should. As a result of this, Nora was a highly vulnerable person with complex special needs. Here's a breakdown of the timeline. On the 4th of August, Nora was reported missing after her father discovered that she wasn't in her bedroom at around 8am that morning. At the time, Nora was sharing her room with her two siblings and the window was open. Nora was the only one to disappear. This call would spark an absolutely astonishing response from law enforcement and search and rescue teams. A multinational team, including hundreds of search and rescue experts, helicopters and drones, all fitted with thermal imaging equipment, arrived on scene quickly. The following day would see a statement released by the missing persons charity, the Lucy Blackham Trust, who stated that the Malaysian police were treating the disappearance as suspicious but officers said that there was no evidence to point to foul play. On the 6th, Nora's family stated publicly that this was completely out of character and Nora would not just have up and left. This is what they had to say. She never goes anywhere by herself. We have no reason to believe that she wandered off and is lost. Five days after the initial disappearance, footprints in the jungle were discovered and there was an investigation as to whether these belonged to Nora. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an answer to that. The number of searches on scene continued to swell during that week and a massive area of the jungle was scoured by hundreds of searchers. She should have been found. Now, this is where things get bizarre. If you've been following the channel, you'll understand that this is a pattern that seems to repeat. According to the mirror.co.uk, on the 13th of August, Nora was found in an area previously searched many times by the search and rescue teams. It raised questions about why she was not spotted there before and the police would not rule out foul play over her passing. Nora was wearing underwear at the time of her disappearance, but police said that she was found without clothing. 
The initial post-mortem examination took place the day after she was found, but returned inconclusive. However, the 15th would reveal that she passed as a result of intestinal problems due to starvation and stress. According to news.yahoo.com, Nora's body was found by a river about 1.6 miles from the area where she had been on holiday with her parents and two siblings. I want to make it clear at this point that the family consistently maintained that Nora would not have just wandered off alone and believed that she must have been taken. However, the state police chief, Mohammed Yusup, said that the post-mortem examination found no evidence that she had been taken, or worse. When her body was discovered, a rescuer named Sean Yip made this observation. It looked like she was sleeping, she had her head resting on her hands. Now let's get even stranger. In an article written by news.yahoo.com, this is what was said, and I quote, Nora couldn't have made it alone to the ravine where her body was found, a volunteer on the Malaysian search team has claimed. The volunteer said Nora, 15, would have found it impossible to cross dense jungle, especially barefoot. She simply could not have gotten there by herself. Dense vegetation snags your feet. The average gradient of the slopes where Nora was found ranged from 20 to 40%. You have to cross two reasonably deep streams to reach the area where she was found. He said that his own boots were destroyed by the difficult terrain, including roots and rocks. Adding, I can't imagine how she could have walked to the place where she was found. I don't normally give my own opinion on these events, but I believe her parents when they say that this is completely out of character and that Nora wouldn't go anywhere alone. I used to work with children who also have complex special needs, similar to Nora, and generally speaking I can say that children with these difficulties do prefer being around their loved ones or people they trust. So I cannot see her just wandering off by herself in an unfamiliar place. However though, as the police detailed, there was absolutely no evidence at all of foul play. So how in the world did Nora get to the place she was found? And why wasn't she there during prior searches? Was she placed there intentionally? Again, there was no evidence of this, so how did she get there? What was the motive for this? She wasn't harmed or worse, or anything of that nature. Is it possible that she could have been lured out of her room? Did she see something visually appealing out the window? Did something catch her interest and lead her out there? Could she have been persuaded to leave her room through the window, verbally, or just out of curiosity? I have absolutely no idea, but this disappearance simply does not make sense. But I will say that it doesn't seem as though she was forced out there physically, as the evidence present does not correlate with that theory. Which begs the question, how in the world did she get to her final location? As the volunteer said, it's basically impossible to reach, especially barefoot. I want to end this segment with a final quote from the BBC, which in my opinion summarises just how strange this disappearance was. Malaysian police said that there was no suspicion the 15-year-old, who was discovered following a 10-day search, was the victim of foul play. Nora passed away two or three days before she was found, the force believes. Her unclothed body was found in an area that had previously been searched by rescuers. So what happened to Nora Quirin? At this point, I want to talk about another disappearance that took place in the Medidi National Park in Bolivia. I've already covered this in a previous video, but I think it should be shared here too. So let me know what you think. The Bolivian Amazon, or specifically, the Medidi National Park, according to nytimes.com, goes from lowland to mountaintop, from 600 feet to almost 20,000 feet above sea level. It covers more than 7,000 square miles of wildly different habitats. It has cloud forests, lowland jungles, rivers, streams, wetlands, it even has glaciers. The locals state that this jungle can swallow you whole in a matter of seconds and they say so for good reason. Rivers are vast and go through mountainous terrain with thick blankets of fog creeping throughout the jungle. Surprisingly, despite its vastness and low visibility, disappearances inside the national park's borders are fairly rare. There hadn't been a single recorded disappearance in the park for a long time until late February 2017. 
At 8.30pm on this particular night, the Medidi Park Rangers received a radio transmission in which it was relayed to them that 25-year-old Meiko Lacuna had disappeared under highly unusual circumstances and left no tracks behind. They were made aware that Meikul had been on a rainforest tour with the local agency Max Adventures, and that he was last seen sitting on the steps of his cabin at around 8.30pm the night before. The park director, Marcos Usquiano, said, This is a really strange case for us, we're not sure what happened last night, but we need to find out. The rangers on scene made comparisons to a disappearance that took place in 1981 where a tourist by the name of Yossi Ginsberg was lied to and given deceitful information by a fellow traveller. This led Yossi to being stranded in the rainforest for three weeks. But this incident was different, after the individuals in the group were questioned, it was thought that this was not the case. The rangers were described as being quiet and looking very determined. They quickly set off and began to search the immediate area inside the rainforest, thinking that Meikul couldn't have gotten very far given the harsh terrain and he was wearing sandals. Phaser, a guide for Max Adventures, relayed some interesting details. Phaser said, in regards to Meikul that, he had returned to the camp acting noticeably excited. He was acting a little bit strange, his face just didn't look normal. Phaser was keeping tabs on Meikul and invited him and the other tourists to participate in a Pachama ceremony, which is an ancient tradition thanking the Mother Earth for giving them permission to enter the forest. Meikul refused the invitation and remained at his cabin. From the point that Phaser left with the other tourists, another guide had made the visit to Meikul within 5 minutes, but he had gone. Phaser and the other guides, equipped with flashlights, scoured the lodge and combed the immediate area inside the nearby forest to no avail. Phaser said that they were searching until 5 in the morning and was surprised that he couldn't be located. Phaser said, and I quote, It's because he offended the Pachamama, he didn't want to participate in the ceremony. After doing a bit of further reading, it seems like the locals are very superstitious of the area and they say that the rainforest is filled with mystical entities both good and bad. Locals believe that to disrespect the Pachamama is to put yourself at risk from being driven mad by Duende, which they believe to be a spirit that lurks in the forest and has the ability to take and hide its victims. One of the guides who had spent most of his life in the area had this to say, for myself and the rangers, this is our culture, we believe that the duende is real and we think that it's possible that Meikle was taken by him. If this incident wasn't already strange enough for you, let's get bizarre. Because they didn't know what to do, the guides called for two shamans, by the names of Romulo and Tabushier, and asked them to bring Meikle back. The pair arrived and brought various ingredients with them, including cigarettes, beers, wine bottles, cocoa leaves, sugar, candles, sparkling confetti and a large wooden cross. They said, and I quote, We believe that Duende has been harnessing the energy of Mapajo, a powerful tree spirit, to hide Meikul. He's far away, in a place we can't reach, but by performing the necessary intricate ceremonies we may be able to bring him back. At this point, Meikul's family, including his father, stepmother and sister had flown in from Chile. Under the guidance of the park rangers and other professionals, they joined the organised search efforts. The rangers thought it best to work section by section, coming multiple kilometres around the lodge by walking in sweeping horizontal lines. I may be wrong, but I get the feeling that some of the rangers didn't care much for what the shamans were doing, and the shamans didn't believe the rangers could be successful until the spirits were appeased. Nevertheless, despite the differences, the rangers searched for 10 hours a day in different sections of the rainforest, desperately trying to find Meikul as they knew time was of the essence. The shamans also stayed up until dawn every night, making offerings and performing their ceremonies in payments to the Pachamama. Interestingly, and perhaps even bizarrely, the rangers did concede that they were surprised that they couldn't find even the slightest sign of him, no tracks or any trace at all. They said it was like he was never there. The experienced trackers among the rangers said that they couldn't believe that they hadn't found a single shred of evidence, and one of them was quoted as saying, In 20 years we've never experienced anything quite like this before. 
For those familiar with the channel, this next part may not come as much of a surprise anymore. Six days after the initial disappearance and tireless searching by all involved, one of the rangers found one of Maykul's socks on the rainforest floor seemingly abandoned. This gave the rangers a location to focus their search efforts and a new plan was produced to zone in on the area, which they immediately began to thoroughly comb. The shaman said that this was a good sign and that the findings changed everything. They were of the opinion that the sock represented a way to reach out to Maykul's soul to bring him back. The shamans then spent the next two days and nights without sleep, performing their ceremonies and presenting offerings to the Pachamama. The following day, they said that their payments had been accepted and that the following days would see more signs of Maykul. The day after this would see the rangers taking a boat down the river where they heard the guides shouting at them to come over. The rangers docked and the guides called out that they'd found Maykul. Surprisingly, while he was somewhat dehydrated and had a lot of bites, he had swollen ankles and he was otherwise okay. Maykul joked and said that he wanted a Coca-Cola. At this point, let's get bizarre again, why not? Maykul was brought back to camp where he told of what happened to him during his time missing. I was trying so hard to find the river, but I just couldn't find it, he told the rescuers. He went on and said that he was only able to make it because he was following a group of monkeys that would drop him fruit and lead him to shelter and water. When asked why he went into the rainforest, this is what he had to say. I was having strange, terrible thoughts about the rainforest and I just wanted to get out. I started running, I was wearing sandals and I said no, they would slow me down. I threw away the sandals, then the cell phone and my flashlight. And after so much running, I stopped under a tree and I started thinking, what had I done, what was I doing, and then when I wanted to get back, it wasn't possible. Makel said that he isn't completely sure what happened to him that night or why he made the decisions he did. Obviously, the shamans on the other hand, alongside the locals, maintained that it was the Duende's doing. They said, the signs fit, his strange behaviour pattern, the maddening thoughts, that's what Duende does. Ultimately though, the circumstances leading up to and during Makel's disappearance remain a mystery. What are your thoughts about this truly bizarre incident? I don't think I've ever come across an incident like this before. But anyway, moving on, let's examine the next disappearance. James Caulfield, 19 years old at the time of his disappearance, was a young farmer and a talented cricketer. James was attending the Royal Welsh Show on the day of his disappearance. If you don't know what this is, and neither did I, this is what their website has to say. Along with an exciting four days of livestock competitions with entries travelling from far and wide to compete, the show has something to interest everyone through its wide range of activities including forestry, horticulture, crafts, countryside sports, shopping, food and drinks and a 12 hour programme each day of exciting entertainment, attractions and display. Given that James was a bit of an outdoorsman, I can see why he would be excited for this event. But unfortunately, something highly unusual would take place on July the 24th, 2017. This was the date that James was last seen leaving the White Horse pub in Bwaylith Wells in the early hours of the morning. James was reported missing the following day at 2pm by his friends when he failed to return to his campsite. This sparked a massive search effort with just an unbelievable outpouring of volunteers who were already in the area for the event. But nothing was found and over 1,000 people flooded the scene and failed to find any trace of him. A few days into the search, volunteers were asked to stand down so that specialist police and SAR teams could better assess the situation. Now, this is where things get bizarre. James's body was found six days after he disappeared on the 30th. He was found in the River Wye, not far from the point he had disappeared. This is highly unusual because the river in question was scoured early on during the search, which means that he was found in an area already searched many times. At this point, I would like to read a short extract from walesonline.co.uk and I quote, A die fed Powys police inspector told the hearing, Mr Caulfield could have been trying to cross the river Wye to reach his campsite. 
Mr. Caulfield would have been able to see the lights and hear music from the young people's village at the time he entered the water. Forensic pathologist Richard Jones told coroner Andrew Barclay that he could not give a cause of passing based on medical probabilities. Dr. Jones from the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff said that there was no evidence of assault or restraint. He said, we are left with the difficult situation that James had been recovered from the water and there is no concrete evidence from the post-mortem examination that he has drowned. The pathologist suggested that Mr. Caulfield may have passed due to the physical effects of being suddenly immersed in cold water. Or in other words, the coroner wasn't exactly sure why or what had caused James passing or why and how he entered the water. James's family did not believe that he would ever have voluntarily entered the water and also stated that he was not a heavy drinker. Roughly 100 milligrams of alcohol was found in his system, but as the coroner stated, there is no way that he could have been intoxicated at this level. Now, let's get even stranger. As the coroner mentioned, there was no evidence to suggest that James had drowned. According to police inspector Andrew Pitt, Mr. Caulfield's body was found in three feet of water around 15 meters from the riverbank. He continued, the area he was found was only three feet deep and had he been there the whole time, I would have expected him to be found there. He finished by indicating that there was no evidence to suggest foul play. Given the sheer number of people in the area at the time, if James's body was in three feet of water, he should have been found. Why was his body only found six days after the disappearance? Was he moved there, and if so, where was he for the rest of the time? Again, to reiterate, there were no signs of aggression, restraint, or any kind of struggle, so how on earth did James enter the water? Why couldn't he be located? The coroner suggested that he may have passed as a result of being suddenly immersed in the cold water. But that doesn't explain why he wasn't found in that location in any of the previous searches of the river. It's important to note at this point that search dogs were present and never picked up his scent at any point during the search. What in the world happened to James Caulfield? Now, let's examine the final disappearance. In late July of 2016, 21-year-old Riley Zickel had planned to go hiking for a day with the intention of visiting his friends in Seattle. So as planned, Riley set off from Broten Bush Lake Road at the Pacific Crest Trailhead. Whilst on this trail, he met up with another hiker and visited the Jefferson Park together before traveling north up the trail again. This was the last time he was ever seen. Riley was reported missing on the 30th of July when he didn't return from the Mount Jefferson Wilderness Area in what was supposed to be an overnight hike. Marion County deputies quickly found his vehicle at a Jefferson Park trailhead. According to Riley's friends and loved ones, he was an experienced hiker and was in possession of the appropriate equipment and a good amount of food and water for his hike. Searchers scoured the area and spoke to many hikers on the trail, but no one had seen him. An emphasis was placed on the areas just north and south of Mount Jefferson in the Willamette National Forest and surrounding areas. Over 182 aircraft from the Civil Air Patrol made daily passes over the search area, but never once found him. These included thermal equipped helicopters, the search ended on the seventh day with authorities stating that they had exhausted all available leads. Over 340 searchers had failed to find any trace of Riley. After the official search concluded, Riley's family conducted their own search immediately afterwards, which also didn't produce any results. This search was also called off after a snowstorm hit the mountain, making any further attempts impossible. According to eu.statesmanjournal.com, the body of a hiker who went missing three years ago was recovered Tuesday on Mount Jefferson thanks to a tip from a group of climbers. 
the Marion County Sheriff's Office was contacted by climbers who believed that they had located Zickle's body in a glacial area above Jefferson Park on Mount Jefferson. The area where he was found is extremely steep with loose rocks and rock avalanches which made for a challenging recovery. They continue, Zickel was found within 350 square miles that were initially searched, Landers said, but it would have been difficult to see him by air. It's important to note that Riley never actually intended to climb the mountain, he was just hiking on the trails below and didn't have any equipment to climb. So why on earth was he found by climbers up the mountain? Was he there when the area was searched initially? What do you think happened here? Please do leave a like if you liked the video, or a dislike if you didn't. Feel free to share your honest opinion. I'd like to hear your thoughts. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you that have subscribed to the channel and who share these videos. I appreciate it a lot, and I can't thank you enough. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible, so thank you very much to all who have signed up. Anyway, do let me know what you thought of this one, and you'll find all of the sources and links in the description below. As always, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. I hope that you have a great day, or evening depending on where you are. Be safe guys, and I'll catch you soon. Peace.